the context of uh, this morning conversation is now going to roll into a really interesting uh, conversation pre presentation from my friend, Mark Pudlasley. Mark is the Director of Economic Policy and Initiatives with the First Nations Major Projects Coalition, which works to advance First Nations economic participation and well-being in the economy and in society. Uh, this focus is on infrastructure and uh, projects that can move forward to really build on the opportunity to eliminate the socioeconomic gaps faced by so many Indigenous people in our country and in British Columbia. The coalition also supports First Nations' inherent responsibilities to the stewardship of their land and works to build and promote Indigenous level environmental assessment processes. Sustainability and ESG principles have long been a part of First Nations culture and leadership and that for centuries uh, have influenced the way that uh, their worldview informs their communities. And Mark's here today to speak with us on valuing Indigenous participation and the real differentiated opportunity we have in British Columbia to work together to be a recipient of that capital that Marcy and others talked about a moment ago. Mark, thanks so much for joining us and over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Greg. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to share my uh, screens with you at the moment here. As you heard this morning from Greg, this ESG question about how to make BC a, a, a destination, premier destination for ESG capital is a vital issue for First Nations individuals, the economy in general, non-Indigenous people. And at the First Nations Major Projects Coalition in March, we took an examination of this, hosting a conference on what ESG would look like. It was interpreted from an Indigenous perspective. This is vitally important for a lot of our people because in our communities where we are asked to host major projects, we will often hear investors or proponents come in and say, don't worry, this is a fully ESG compliant project. Which then made us start to ask, well, what's in these ESG standards that these people can come in, sometimes from um, cities outside of Canada, and tell us that these projects are good for the environment, which we are very attached to, and the social questions in our communities. So this, uh, what I'm going to share with you now, is a very brief overview of what we prepared as a primer document for our membership. And the conference itself we held in March had 1,500 participants evenly split between Indigenous people, institutional investors, and corporate. It was a phenomenal discussion, and I want to share some of what we discovered in that process with you now. So the conference report is available online, and the link will be available at the end of the session. And I'm, I'm going to ask my slides be shown, please, as we were discussing. ESG itself, as you heard from Greg, is vital to the competitiveness of the, pro of the province to attract capital. For Indigenous people, the involvement of corporate in interests like in projects and investments have the ability to improve our economies, our social conditions, and we are looking towards that future. When we started out examining what ESG is and where it came from, we quickly discovered that, that there is an... <laughs> that there is a need for ESG, a history of ESG for our people to understand where this came from and what's involved. ESG, as you heard from Greg originally, is about $40 trillion capital worldwide and is growing. It's growing at about 15% per year. So what's important now is that the province position itself to capture this, this capital for the benefit of the entire province. So we as Indigenous people, being the ones on the ground hosting these projects, we're very concerned about how much Indigenous involvement there had been in setting these standards to ensure that they actually took Indigenous interests to heart. We contacted a lot of the agencies and we found out that the answer is zero. Indigenous people had not been involved in, in the settings of ESG sustainability standards anywhere. This caused us great concern because that, that's the question, is ESG doing what it's supposed to do, which is to make better projects that do benefit the environment, the social and governance questions of the projects involved. Most troubling was what came out in GRI, one of the main principal standards used worldwide, is in GRI, they have a clause in section 411-11 that says indigenous people's concerns and interests are only material and have to be reported if there's a legal court challenge. At that point, that forces Indigenous people to see a project coming to immediately go to court 
to have their interests seen by the rating agencies. Hardly a recipe for reconciliation, and certainly not in the interest of indigenous people who do want to participate in projects. So just a brief history of how this came to be. ESG in its current form is fairly new. It only came into effect around 2006. Uh, it was launched by the United Nations. They launched something called the PRI, Principles Responsible Investment, and a few years later, the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. What these did was that they set ESG as it is now, but they did not set the standards. The standards came by the market. And as you heard earlier presentation here, is that there are now hundreds of standards. So much so that soon aggregated standards came to pull these into something more manageable. And now, because there's so many of those, there's calling for a mega standard. There's two on the books right now are being proposed, one from the World Economic Forum and the other from IFRS. But we will talk about those at another time. We looked at the four principal aggregated standards for our conference. And we found these four. So just briefly, what would happen is institutional investor rating your company or a company or investment would take a look at the aggregated standards. And if they didn't find it in one, they might look at another. And if they didn't find what they were looking for there, they would look to a, another one of the smaller standards. And based on this information, they'd be able to approve or deny an investment. But for indigenous people, the question comes, what happens if there's no indigenous involvement in the standards at all? How can a ratings agency give an ESG approved rating to a company that has not even reported on this question? So that's where our focus came into place uh, as an organization, as indigenous people. So if a company is using ESG and it has a company up here that has to be looked at, when we spoke to the large principal pension funds in the country, they said that without the information that they require immediately available when they review the company, they are forced to look on their own with their own lens to see if indigenous interests have been accommodated. They didn't like doing this. They thought that was a risky thing for them to do because they are not directly involved in indigenous issues. And I should point out, neither they had indigenous people doing this. What they did tell us though, is that if they did look deeper into the company and they saw an indigenous equity placement or investment in the company, essentially co-proponency, then that would be the gold standard to which they could then feel confident that yes, indigenous interests had been accommodated in the entire investment. So the question then comes, where do, you pe where do people find lists or data on indigenous investment in projects? And the place for that is Moody's Investor Services. They came out with a report a couple of years ago that highlighted this entire question about indigenous involvement in infrastructure. But what was really instructive about the report is they listed how indigenous people are doing this. I wanna highlight one line from that report. It's this one, with larger equity stakes, financing of equity will be a bottleneck for indigenous investors. The key word here is this one, the key term, indigenous investors. The difference now is that indigenous people are looking to become partners in projects. It is not about handouts. It's about becoming fully involved in the operation, the benefits, and the risks of companies that do incorporate indigenous interests. If you go through that report online, you'll find it, is that there's a listing of different projects around the country, at least in the infrastructure space, and indigenous people have taken equity investment positions. So that's now. What about going forward? I can tell you now that there is great interest from indigenous investors toward the net zero carbon solution future. And if you go around the country right now, and they're on the screen, I'm not going to read them for time purposes, you will find different projects where indigenous investment and interest is building and there are investment stakes. Every one of these projects will be financed in a different manner, but the trend is clear. For any project in this country to proceed, indigenous people must be involved in a substantive way. And the most substantive way is to be partners in equity or ownership in some form. In British Columbia, the main concern for indigenous involvement in major projects to build and attract capital is access to capital. What we need as indigenous investors is the means to put money into projects to be partners going forward. 
there will need to be some policy changes because of historical uh, realities in this country and in this province. Some of them are listed there and they exist in other provinces, but they generally don't exist here. Loan guarantees, there's programs for this in Alberta and Ontario. Revolving loan funds, it's being discussed and the whole challenge of green bonds. The question for Indigenous people is how do we raise the capital to become involved? And how do we have partners to do that? So, as you heard at the beginning, ESG, how does BC become a premier destination for ESG investors? We have many things, and Radha said them right at the beginning. And the ones I want to highlight is we have Clean BC. We are one of the lowest carbon uh, intensive uh, power generation uh, generation uh, jurisdictions on the planet. We have the DRIPA Act, the yeah? United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, first in the country, soon to be implemented in Canada. But what we do not have is a way for Indigenous people to access capital. Those are the challenges that we're looking forward to include Indigenous people in the prosperity of British Columbia and increase our overall prosperity. So I leave you with this. If we are going to improve the lives of everybody in British Columbia, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, there has to be a way to make this integration tighter and more effective to raise our ability to attract those trillions of dollars in ESG capital. The report that I just referenced is online and you can find it at the Major Projects Coalition website. And I wish you a good conference. much for your thought leadership and for your ongoing partnership <clears throat> as you shared with us um, indigenous people's perspectives and also partnership are essential of building a sustainable economy in every sector of the economy in british columbia and in my own personal view uh, we can be a differentiating jurisdiction with an advantage through those partnerships that leads to greater clarity and certainty on the land base for esg driven investors as we advance the opportunity together and I want to thank you for sharing your presentation today and look forward to the work together going forward to access the capital that you spoke to.